So this is a slightly different kind of film where we're going to be sense making the coronavirus outbreak. And things are sort of changing day by day, minute by minute. And this is a real sort of uh, task for sense making. So in this, we're going to play a few clips from different people. Some people have been on the channel before, some people who are new. And looking at sort of the wider context, the challenges to making sense of it, what are the sort of systemic fragilities and what are the sort of second order um, issues that this is likely to throw up. I mean, it feels like it's almost certain to uh, stress test our societies, like the sense making and also healthcare system and all of the other systems as well. And this is going to be a live sort of ongoing sense making exploration. So we're going to obviously return to this in, in future days. I kind of feel a little bit kind of frazzled right now, uh, kind of information overload myself. Yeah, and in these kind of environments, I certainly feel a real sense of responsibility around like anyone sharing information in this time. I think there's an extra level of responsibility and awareness that, that certainly I feel and we feel in, in, in doing this because anything that we're sharing can have serious consequences. And so we're going to be really, really careful with what we're saying, what we're, what we're sharing, while at the same time trying to hold the, the fact that things are uncertain. Some of the information seems to contradict itself. There are different perspectives and that we all need to upregulate and to improve our sense making and discernment as we, as we kind of go through this. So we have interviews with uh, Thomas Pueo, who wrote uh, an article that you may have read. It, it, it was hugely popular. It's been shared over 24 million times. It's an amazing piece of work of about 37 pages. And as far as I can tell, it's more complete and more well-researched than anything I've seen in the mainstream media. And Thomas isn't a journalist. Thomas is, works in tech. So this is going to be another factor as we look at, like, where are the if some of the sense-making organs are being overwhelmed and are uh, not fit for purpose, where are the new sense-making uh, people and networks coming from? We're also going to hear from two people who've been on the channel before, Alex Evans, who's a former UK government advisor and also the creator of the Collective Psychology Project. We're also going to hear from Josh Fields, who was on the channel quite recently talking about collapse and systems change, systems fragility. And we're also going to hear from Joe Edelman of Human Systems. And Joe has not been on the channel before, but he is in this sort of wider sense-making community and is very, very highly regarded. And he's got a lot of really interesting stuff to share. So you mentioned the word frazzled before, and that's certainly what I'm feeling right now, having been delving into lots of different sources of information. And there's a, a couple of other concepts we've talked about on the channel, which I think are really being tested right now. So one of them is sovereignty, this ability to stay connected to ourselves, but also be receptive to the world. And another is discernment. You know, with this huge amount of information and a huge amount of uncertainty, complexity and chaos, really, with things changing every day. You know, I've certainly felt that in myself, my, both of those things, my sovereignty, uh, my connectedness to myself, and then also my discernment, especially this huge, uh, almost overwhelm of information. So that, uh, and I've also been reminded, you know, I think, well, firstly, I think we're all experiencing that. Or, Pretty much everyone I've spoken to is experiencing that. It's something we're we're all experiencing kind of at the same time, um, and so this this process of making sense live feels like important. But for me, also feels like one of the only things uh, I feel like I can do right now. It's just kind of uh, do the best job I can uh, and, and kind of making sense, staying as centered as I can, and being being as discerning as I can as well. Yeah, I think, and it's one of those times where you can almost feel like the collective consciousness. Like everyone is aware of this, everyone is responding in their own ways. And just the blizzard of sense making as well, just things are changing hour by hour, minute by minute. And probably even by the time we upload this in a couple of hours time, things will have changed. So this is not that, this is not an attempt to kind of make sense of what the current state of affairs is. And we're going to direct people to and give some links to uh, people to follow on Twitter and other, uh, other sense making environments so people can kind of track that stuff. Given that this is kind of real-time sense-making, we would love to hear from you guys. Uh, put any sort of really well-researched or really interesting sense-making resources into the comments below. We are also uh, opening up a new thread on the Discord channel, and we're looking to, to make sense while being mindful that we don't want to take resources away from people who are doing that well elsewhere. So if you feel that there are communities that are doing this well elsewhere, 
uh, please do get in touch. So we've created a new email address for anyone who feels they've got something to add to this kind of ongoing project, and we'll bring that up on screen now. So I'm going to play uh, part of the interview with Thomas Pueo, who wrote this incredibly viral article that has been shared over 24 million times in the last few days. You wrote an article that was incredibly well researched. I think it was about 39 pages in total uh, that has been very, very popular. I think it's been shared over 24 million times now in the last few days. Would you just be able to sort of summarize what do you think is the main takeaway from that article that people need to know? The number of cases of coronavirus is exploding globally. People don't realize that's happening because this is exponential. Uh, which means that at the beginning it's very slow and suddenly it explodes. Um, that is why most countries have not taken the measures that they needed to take. The moment to take the measures is when it's here, it's not when it's here. Uh, at that point, uh, the outbreak has already exploded. So what you need, uh, so the goal of the, of the article was uh, explain what's going to happen, um, which is if you don't do anything, the cases are going to ex explode. Once they explode, they're going to overrun the healthcare system. Once they do, the mortality rate of uh, the coronavirus will explode, um, probably up to 10x, 10 times uh, higher mortality. Thomas, can I ask your, your background? Because I understand you're not in the media, you're not a journalist. How long yeah. did it take you to write and what's your background for, for doing this? So I had spent, before I wrote it, I had spent around two weeks uh, researching this around four, four to five hours a day. Um, and I think uh, your underlying question is, why should people listen to me? Um, and I think the answer is they shouldn't. They shouldn't listen to me. Uh, I, I am not an epidemiologist. I am not a biologist. What I've done is gather all the research from all of these different places and put it in one place so that people can understand it. Um, you should judge the article based on the data and the arguments and the sources, not on the fact that it's me. It, it so happens that um, I have a couple of uh, um, background um, elements that have helped me put this together. Uh, I'm an engineer. I have two masters of science, so I'm very, very close to all things uh, data and analysis and statistics. I worked as a consultant where I had to get into companies and understand them within two to three weeks. So I'm very, uh, I have experience uh, 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 going deep into understanding a problem very, very quickly. I also created some viral applications that uh, exploded to up to 20 million users. So I am acquainted with the analytics of virality. Um, so I think these are some of the reasons why I was able to put these two together, but people don't, shouldn't see me as uh, the person making the arguments, but rather making the assembly of the arguments. And so we talk a lot on, on this channel. We look very closely at sense making. What are the failures in sense making? And especially about how do we get better? How do we up regulate our discernment and our sense making? And it's really interesting that you seem to be doing something that so far the mainstream media hasn't done to that level. Why do you think that is? Well, the, the, the media and, uh, and, uh, and politicians, um, and, and, and I care about both, but I care more about politicians. Um, I, think, I think one of the key uh, mental frameworks that most people are lack is exponential growth. Um, the, the, in my job, I didn't mention that, but in my job, both in the viral applications, but, but in tech in general, uh, you, you're going for exponential growth and you understand the, the mechanics of exponential growth. So when you see that something is growing at 20% or 30% day over day, you freak out. Uh, either you're super happy if it's your product or you're super, super, super scared if it's a virus. Uh, but because you understand what's going to happen in a week, two weeks, three weeks, three months, four months. Um, so I think that's what, that's one of the key issues uh, why people didn't understand what was going to happen. Um, th th there's also uh, uh, an issue of um, connecting the dots here because it's not just one uh, part. Uh, this, this is a puzzle and, and you need to put it together. And most uh, uh, journalists, especially when they're covering news, they are not trained to put all the pieces together. 
we're seeing a lot of systemic fragilities in various different areas. And one of them is the ability to make sense of the crisis. And I think one of the things that's required is for people to, to improve their discernment, to step up and potentially alternatives to some of the failing systems are emerging. And I would put you in that bracket as someone who seems to be making sense of the outbreak better than most, if not all in the mainstream media. Sense that, that people are having to step up here we are in a perfect example of new information coming to society. Uh, it reminds me of, for example, what happened with, uh, with Brexit or, or the Trump election in 2016, where um, it, it, it took everybody aback. Uh, nobody knew how to interpret that uh, situation, right? Uh, and so suddenly there's this new information in the system and, and, and the system just doesn't know how to uh, cope with it. Uh, and so it tries to digest it. So the question becomes, when you have these, this doesn't happen frequently, by the way, but, but, but when it happens, what is the best process to, uh, um, uh, to, to process this information as quickly as possible? And I would say what is uh, happening today is the right way to do it. Yeah, this film is not to concentrate on sort of the logistics of the virus, like the transmission rates or the uh, ways of protecting ourselves and all of that. That's really available elsewhere. Uh, I'd highly recommend the Joe Rogan podcast and the Sam Harris podcast recently with experts in the field. And it's really interesting to see how these long form podcasts do feel like they're coming into their own when there's, an, there's a very complex situation. I would just add to that as well, as you're talking about it, what strikes me is that another thing that the traditional news outlets struggle to do is cooperate in the same way that, that people are cooperating online, where it's decentralized, it's not a competition. It's about people finding and sharing the best information and that builds on itself in a very decentralized way as opposed to we've got the scoop and we better, we better hold on to this. Completely different model. So we're going to play a very short clip now from the Sam Harris podcast with Amish Adelja from the Johns Hopkins uh, University. It's still an enormous number of people dead from this virus. Yeah, I think it is going to be more than people will imagine, but will it be cataclysmic? I, I don't think that's that's the case. The highest flu death rate we have, I think, outside of a pandemic is 80,000 in 2017 to 2018. Right. So this is a magnitude higher than that. And I do think it's going to be disruptive and bad. But I, I think that what I'm worried about is that people's actions and reactions and 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 panic will actually make things worse and 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 really lead to this kind of cascading effect where where hospitals can't operate, where where there is widespread social chaos going on. And that's what, what really worries me more than the virus itself. Yeah, so that clip really leads into what most of the rest of this is going to be about, which is the second order consequences, the systemic fragility, and how this might play out. I'm going to start with the, the, the way that different countries are responding to this. In particular, the UK seems to be taking, and again, this is changing kind of hour by hour, like the UK has 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 changed position quite significantly even in the last couple of days even today but the U the UK had decided on a very different path to many other countries so Italy went into lockdown um China went into lockdown that seems to be what Spain is doing and what most of the other European countries are doing the UK decided on a course of what they're calling herd immunity and this is why this is really interesting is that the UK, one of the most senior advisors in the UK is a guy called Dominic Cummings. And Dominic Cummings is incredibly well versed in complexity theory, in some of the kind of topics that we've talked about on the channel and a lot of people who are kind of involved in making sense, uh, in the sort of sense making community would be very well aware of. Uh, and Cummings, if you look at his blog, he kind of details all of these, like he, he's a first principles thinker, He's very allergic to doing what everyone else is doing. He's very allergic to the status quo. And so it's interesting that he's chosen, or we assume that he's heavily involved in this decision by the UK government to the, the nature of the British political system, if you're kind of watching from, from the US, is much more centralized than the US. And power is, is very concentrated on the prime minister and very concentrated in the prime minister's advisor in this case. He's, he's very, very powerful in the UK. And 
despite the huge pressure to change course. At the moment, the UK looks to be taking a different step. And I talked to Alex Evans, who, as I said, used to work in the British government about this, and also Josh Fields. So they're talking about something called herd immunity, yeah. which is that they're assuming that most people will get the virus. So they're wanting to, to manage the numbers. Um, and once, once they're calculating that 60% of people have developed immunity, then there will be some immunity in the population. But I think that also depends on one key uh, unknown or that may be unknown is whether immunity develops. And if immunity doesn't yeah. develop, then that's a, not only a high risk strategy, it's actually potentially a really suicidal strategy. Yeah, so let me just unpack that a little bit. Herd immunity is really the UK, this is the second principle of why UK government policy is different. Herd immunity is basically saying, look, people are gonna get the virus anyway. We should let people get said virus, but ensure that it is um, mainly low risk, risk groups, low risk categories who end up getting the virus. And what will this do? Well, the, the hypothesis is they get the virus, they recover from the virus, and in so doing, they actually build immunity to the virus, and so they don't become future carriers of said virus. Now, why might this be a wise strategy? Because in other words, it's basically saying, let's give more of the population this infection, right? Why might this be wise? Um, I think part of the thinking behind it is if you go to China or Italy and people are in quarantine, these people aren't actually building immunity, right? Because they're not, a lot of them are not actually picking up the virus. It's just a self, self it's, a, it's a precautious measure to stop the spread. Now, if the virus is, is doubling in size every four days, in terms of the number of people it's affecting, that quarantine is an excellent way to stop that spread, but it doesn't do much for future immunity. And so I think part of the rationale behind this is if you give low risk groups more of the infection, we build the immunity over time. And so we won't need interventions like quarantine six, 12 months in the future. In China and Italy, what happens if everybody starts to come out on the streets again, and then suddenly there's another, vi there's another outbreak of the virus, they have to go back to the quarantine. Whereas if our population become, could become more resistant, that could be hypothetically a good thing. Now, this is extreme, This is a high risk, high reward strategy because what it basically confers is or suggests is we can actually build herd, immuni herd immunity, right? I think that's problematic for two reasons. The first, there's absolutely fuck all evidence that we can. There's an implicit assumption from virologists that this is what tends to happen. And which, by the way, I'd really like to see open sourced. We're, we're, we're basing our surrender to herd immunity on models we don't understand or have not seen. But the second is um, the presupposition that we can actually build, build immunity so, um, is, really su suggests or, or hopes that our immune systems are strong enough to do that. But our local, our, our modern world with toxins and pollution and the shit we eat, suggests that immune systems aren't quite now what they, what they once were. And so it's a big risk. It's a hell of a big risk. And I'd love to see things open sourced to really know why the rationale for this. But just, so to, but just to give a summary then, the UK is different in two ways. We're not, in, we're not encouraging social, uh, social isolation because of behavioral psychology and because of herd immunity. Both of those things rely on two major, um, two major assumptions. One is capacity to predict and the capacity to build immunity. I think we need to see more evidence to why those are fair, fair assumptions to make. <clears throat> yeah, and it's interesting, there was a, a letter today or a series of letters to the Times from very senior medical people making exactly those points, that we need to see the models, we need to understand why the government is taking these decisions. And while I'd agree with you, I also wonder if there's a second um, factor involved or another factor involved, which is that we're, very, we're not very good at talking about risk, especially in the media. The media is generally very good at um, to sell papers at sort of over, overstating risks. So I think the reason that they haven't done this so far is that once you start once you start having a really honest conversation about the UK's strategy, the mm -hmm. next question that will come back from journalists is, so are you saying that you're basically encouraging people to get the virus? Are you saying that you are going to willfully 
allow people to die because of this virus? And the answer to those is going to be yes, because that is the strategy that the UK has, has chosen. But that's not a strategy that can be reported well in the media. You can see the headlines now. Government yeah. says people must die. So that is, I think, another failure condition of this, of the response to the virus is that we're, we're terrible at understanding and talking about risk. And we're terrible about being able to communicate that without scaremongering. And that's, that's another systemic fragility that I think is being shown up with, the, with what's going on at the moment. One, one if, if we were to speak in really crude terms as to what herd immunity actually means in practice, it's really us taking age or the government taking agency over how much it titrates the virus. It basically says we're going to allow the virus to get to this amount when we think it's reached our, our peak, i.e. when we think our health care resources can no longer handle more, we will titrate it and we'll sc- close schools and we'll lead to social isolation. But really, if you kind of read between the lines of what that means, it is really saying like, we're going to allow death now, now we're going to stop death. We're going to allow death now, and we're going to stop death. And I think that is yeah, politically infeasible. On the media aspect, um, I think you're right that it, it becomes difficult for the government to be upfront about the dilemmas and trade-offs that any government has to navigate in this kind of an issue. Because as you say, the media will often you know, go into kind of gotcha mode and aim to kind of embarrass the government or go for the most sensational angle possible. I mean, it's not unlike the Facebook algorithm, which will push content at us that's the most triggering or outraging or scary content, because they know that that's the most effective way of monetizing our attention. And of course, the media have many of the same uh, incentives in place. So, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the interesting things in all of this is that, you know, we are all speculating about what is the top down strategy from government here. But also, if we focus on the things that are, if you like, within our own circle of control, there is this whole other aspect, which is the bottom-up response to it, um, which is both about people's own decisions in their everyday lives, whether they observe social distancing protocols um, or just assume, well, I'll be fine, it doesn't matter if I get it, Um, whether they're engaging in panic buying or leaving goods for others and so on. Um, So there's that aspect. And also, I think we're seeing this weekend in particular, a huge amount of self-organizing happening in communities to build street and neighborhood level resilience um, in a way that's really encouraging. And I think, you know, however it plays out, and however the government strategy pans out over time, this is stuff that can only be a good thing. So I think there's, if you like, two sides to the resilience story here. So I just wanted to recap uh, the proviso in that, because it is really, really important that the assumption of the herd immunity strategy, like we're not advocating one way or another. We're trying to make sense of different conflicting narratives and conflicting perspectives without trying to collapse into any one of them. But the the, the important thing here is that the British government's assumption about herd immunity relies on the fact that once someone has had the virus, they develop immunity. And that is an assumption. And if that's not the case, then what the UK is thinking of doing becomes infinitely more dangerous. In fact, uh, very, very dangerous. So I just want to kind of put a flag in that. That's something you need, we need to watch out for and sort of more information onto whether that's the case. Um, and the other thing that it's worth flagging up, uh, again, that was mentioned in those clips, is this is really challenging to mainstream media sense making because we're, it's very, very difficult to talk about risk in a sane, sensible way when sensationalism rules and you can just see the, the, the questions that would be asked at the press conferences, the potential newspaper headlines, where the question is, okay, you're pursuing a herd immunity strategy, Mr. Boris Johnson. So are you saying that you want people to get the virus? Are you saying that people, that you are going to pursue a strategy that means more people will die? And then you end up with potentially newspaper headlines that say government kills the elderly or something like that, because we can't talk about systemic risk. We can't talk about the balance of risks sensibly in a sensationalist media environment. And that's another of the sort of systemic fragilities that we're seeing being kind of flagged up here. And this is something that I also talked about with some of the interviewees. You've just put out a piece called The Corona Crisis and Designing Better Social Systems. And you say right at the beginning of it um, that this Corona crisis and the economic crash connected to it reveals yet again how Western institutions and social systems are failing. 
Do you want to expand on that? What are you seeing already that is, has led you to conclude that? Yeah, sure. I think there's, it's a, it's a lot. So um, one thing that's failing is the media. And in general, there's a feeling that um, the US and the UK have suffered a kind of decay uh, where people trust the government less uh, than they used to, where the government kind of deserves less trust uh, than it used to deserve. Uh, for a few of us that are following the right accounts on Twitter, we've actually been in a better position to make sense of the crisis. But at the same time, there's uh, massive misinformation and confusion going on, uh, very little ability to cohere around that. If you look at what's trending and the tweets that are going the most viral, these are not actually the ones that have the best information content. Um, so we see breakdown in media, we see a breakdown in political systems. What do you think about the crisis in sense making that we're seeing now? Yeah. So I've been writing about this for a couple of years, been thinking about it a hell of a lot. And when we think about um, sense making, think about it in two ways. The, the first is the information that is coming into our environment, from our environment, and also our capacity to discern that information from that environment. And so if we look at the first one, this exponential increase in misinformation, disinformation and fake news means that as sense-making organisms, we're struggling to actually know what, what information we can actually trust, okay? And so I don't know if you've seen with this coronavirus stuff, you've got the hippie dippies on one side, basically going, this is all some sort of conspiracy theory by the government and it's all about love. And if you're panicking, your you're lower chakra energies, whatever they want to say. Um, and then there's, there's a uh, bots most likely disseminating bad information in order to increase systemic instability. Um, and so the, the information ecology is, is a fucking mess. It's, it's a fucking mess. And so if we're trying to actually get behind um, a consistent narrative as to what to do, and there are all these competing claims on social media, it becomes hell of a hard to sense make. I think part of that is linked to um, we've lost trust in our institutions. We've lost trust in our um, epistemological authorities. And um, that's problematic if we want to create a coherent, cohesive response. The other problem is, and this is when I go to the second point, which is our ability to actually take in that information because we're so overwhelmed with anxiety and mental health issues, because our concentration capacities are actually decreasing, our ability to make discerning and sovereign decisions about what is good information and what is bad information is also compromised. So you have this juxtaposition of shitty information and shitty capacity to handle that information. In the presence of exponential complexity, it's, uh, it's highly problematic. And I think part of the issue with that, man, yes, there's an epistemological crisis because we're not trusting I think part of the reason we, we, we're not trusting is because this lack of truth that's disseminating, right? Um, but why, how did we get to a position of a lack of truth in the first place? And I think part of it is we in the West, the, the, the heralds and the, and, and the creators of the cultures of science and technology and engineering, i.e. truth-based paradigms, we ourselves have actually taken on more a face over truth culture than a truth over face culture. And so this, um, we've normalized deceit in our culture, but because it's so normalized, people don't think it's actually a problem. You add exponential technology to that cultural adaptation of deceit just, over truth. Can you explain that cultural adaptation a little bit more, just what you mean by that face over truth. Yeah, so when, when you look at um, a lot of Asian cultures, Asian cultures tend to um, put their family's reputation or their, their, um, their external projection to the world over and above what is actually true. So a lot of people have summarized this as <clears throat> Western culture is more of a guilt-based culture and Eastern culture is more of a shame-based culture in that right. social shame or what people think of you is the primary driver of behavior in the East in the east yeah. in the west it's like individual conscience and your own um yeah being being able to square your own actions with your own inner truth and and more of the christian tradition is, is more on the individual 
and that what you're saying, and I think I've, I've heard a few other people say as well, is like in the social media age and mm-hmm. in the in the the environment that we've created for ourselves now, it's much more in the West about what we people think of ourselves and less about the actual behaviour. Yeah, we've. I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that we've created the cultural for that we've created the cultural container that is just ripe for misinformation, disinformation, and fake news because our culture doesn't actually no longer actually holds truth to be one of its highest virtues or values. Instead, it holds this kind of like this narcissistic co-optation. Um, more to be more significant and more important. And then we have the issue of systemic fragility. I think we're all realizing that there's going to be many second and third order consequences of this as it kind of cascades through the system. And that's something that I talked to both Josh and to Joe about. How do you see this playing out sort of in the, in the I guess, medium term in terms of the systemic fragilities? Mm. I mean, I think we're we're probably in for a pretty bad economic downturn, um, and I think what's happening is is actually very promising, promising, and exciting. Um, we're seeing a delegitimization of certain ways of doing things, and then a possible legit new legitimization of other newer ways of doing things. And I think this is how political change happens uh, more generally. Like if we look at transitions from monarchies to representative democracies, uh, it's often assumed that there's some kind of like revolution and that this is the main moment that it happens. But if you look at the American Revolution, for instance, the people that kind of took over during the American Revolution were actually already running things in the colonies. And they had a different way of operating citizens' assemblies and things like that. Um, so they had, they had developed legitimacy Uh, under the radar, uh, below the level of the monarchy and the official representatives of the king. And so by the time they wanted to have an American revolution, they'd kind of proven themselves uh, as a new way of operating and uh, and proven themselves in a series of crises before the kind of big crisis of the American revolution. And I think this is how, this is the more, more common way that political change happens. And we can see it happening right now as uh, the CDC, um, you know, some governmental actors uh, become delegitimized. The way that they do things clearly isn't working for the people. And uh, new actors that maybe have no relationship to government uh, are looking uh, very responsible and very capable. And uh, I think what we need to do right now is we need to do our best to make sure that the capable looking actors are also promising in terms of new social mechanisms, in terms of new political mechanisms. Uh, We wouldn't want this to go into a moment where we develop a more authoritarian or even fascist uh, operating system because that works. We we need to make sure that we have some kind of um, hopefully sort of quasi-democratic, uh, optimistic uh, new systems that are seen to be performing well in the crisis. And are you seeing any, th- any sort of um, real world networks or projects that are kind of, that are happening now that are giving you hope or that you're paying attention to? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I see many um communities i see that there's a kind of a techno hippie scene which i think is doing great work it's kind of like the the burning man kind of that area (laughs) i see a lot of really talented nerdy people also the rationalists the effective altruists these people seem to be responding rapidly organizing doing better than the metamodernists, better than a lot of the political theorists. Um, I think what's one kind of group that's shining right now is the kinds of people who have 60 meetups around the world, like this kind of group. And it may be that they've been doing, I don't know, 
circling or yeah, I don't know, responsible charity stuff in the past, but now they're ready to coordinate and do something uh, more immediate, more useful. So I think, I think we're seeing a, a, a lot of these kinds of global community, global, local communities mm. are having a moment to shine. I think we all have a sense that there's going to be huge unintended consequences coming out of this that we're not really aware of yet. I was with a family member yesterday who is in recovery from alcoholism. And I was just thinking, um, this person has a huge, has quite a lot of social events that they're going to, they're involved in going to recovery meetings. If those sort of things shut down, like these unintended consequences, I know that the, that this person will relapse, for example. Then we've got people who, um, like, and, and we know, for example, that we're, we're such social creatures that we need, we actually need human connection. Like social isolation is an actual torture. Sorry, uh, individual isolation in, what do they call it, in, in jail? Not social isolation. Um, oh, um, solitary confinement. confinement. So we know that solitary confinement in jail is actually a torture because we are the kind of creatures that need to meet, to connect, to align our stories. To And if we don't, if we don't do that, we, we tend to atrophy. So are you worried about what that might mean sort of longer term or medium term? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The data shows that loneliness is actually as bad for life expectancy as smoking 15 or 20 cigarettes a day. Um, and I think, as you say, this is going to be one of the consequences of consequences, if you like, of the coronavirus outbreak. And I think one of the particularly cruel twists of this is that the people, some of the most vulnerable people to coronavirus, like elderly people, who are the ones who will really need to stay home, are often communities among whom loneliness is spiking in the first place. Mm. And so you have this added twist that you know they won't be able to see the grandchildren, but also they won't be able to have the kind of you know, day-to-day so-called weak ties contact with people like, you know, someone at the GP surgery, someone at the post office, someone in the supermarket, those sort of little day-to-day interactions that make you feel at least connected in your community. So the emotional toll of all of this is going to be really hard. You're going to have lots of people either sick or just isolating for their own protection and feeling bored, lonely, anxious. And then as the as the epidemic moves on, there will also be grief to contend with because you know we'll start to see deaths. And I think the question of what sort of support mechanisms we can get in place while obviously observing social distancing protocols, the really important one. One of the really encouraging things that is happening this weekend is that I'm seeing lots and lots of things on Twitter where people are going out into their own communities, just you know, now before the tsunami hits to reach out and just get their neighbors' contact details. And for example, just set up a street-level WhatsApp group, which can be, on the one hand, a way for people to kind of check in and stay up with news and share content and just sort of feel connected. But also, that's going to be a way of coordinating community self-help so that if there's people that you know need prescriptions or supermarket shops picking up or maybe they need cooking for or their dogs walking, that sort of stuff can self-organize and just emerge very quickly. But it is important that, you know, the bandwidth, the kind of the social network connections are in place on WhatsApp or on a Facebook group or whatever it may be before things get really difficult. So that's a great concrete thing that all of us can get on with this weekend. So I really want to emphasize that this is live sense making. A lot of this is provisional, could change sort of in the next hour, even by the time maybe we put this out. And we want to... Yeah, we want to ramp up our ability to kind of make sense and relay accurate information as best as possible. So do put kind of useful links, useful information in the in the comments below. And as I said, we've created a new thread in the Discord. That will be in, we're going to put all of the links and all of the relevant kind of people to follow on Twitter and uh, places to go for good sense making into the show notes. So do look at that. Do... If you are someone who's been following this, you have high discernment, high sovereignty, and you think that you can contribute, we'd love to hear from you at this uh, email address here. And we'll be updating this regularly. We'll, of course, be putting out more films and more information as we get it. So thank you for watching and see you soon.